Um, our keynote speaker is uh, Nicol Dr. Nicola Parinit from Rhodes University. Uh, she does a lot of things. Nicola provides learning design support and consultation in relation to teaching with technology, that is technology integration and blended and online teaching and learning. She is also she also supports lecturers to design appropriate technology mediated learning experiences for their students, supervises postgraduate students and co-teachers for more courses in higher education. She, she enjoys meeting educational technology practitioners and researchers from across the globe and is part of the Emerge Africa team. And if you want to know more about the Emerge Africa team, you can always talk to see it because you can join it if you want. Nicola is going to talk to us uh, on the to topic facilitating <coughs> care online. And she will be drawing on her experiences of how supporting staff and students at Rhodes co facilitating an online course for staff across Africa and trauma informed pedagogists. She shares practical advices for facilitating with care online in these uncertain and difficult times, especially uh, during the pandemic. With that, I would like to thank uh, Nicola for accepting to be our keynote speaker today and uh, welcome her to give her keynote and uh, hope that colleagues will find whatever uh, Nicola is going to share with us quite uh, enlightening. Um, with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Nicola Palit. Nicola, you are welcome. Thank you so much, Eunice. Um, can everyone hear me? Maybe you can just type Y in the, in the chat, if you can hear me clearly. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, everyone. So, you know, huge greetings. Um, I'm really, um, you know, this is my first time. I'm hoping to do a bit of a non-traditional keynote. And I'm glad my keynote is actually my first one for all of you because I visited CPUT a few times, co-presented or attended workshops and have wonderful colleagues here. Um, I'll be honest that I found myself Googling what makes a good keynote. <laughs> um, and I hope to start off with just unifying us and setting the tone for what's to come. So from the session titles on the program for today, I know that you have many champions at CPUT who probably already facilitate with care online, who can inspire, who can inspire colleagues beyond today. I don't think it's my role. Uh, I hope to offer some inspiration, but I know that you have many inspirational colleagues um, at your institution. So the aim, I think, you know, inspiring is really a share endeavor, in shared endeavor. Um, and I think from the program, it's going to be a day of inspiration ahead. Um, the other thing keynotes are supposed to do are to unify. And I think at the moment we are unified by having to pivot to multimodal or emergency remote teaching and learning. That has been a challenge, uh, you know, it's been a challenging experience for both staff and students alike. Um, I recognize that it's a difficult time for everyone. So I want to start by asking, how are you, how are you feeling today? Uh, if you can please share in the chat if you're comfortable to do so, or just, you know, check in with yourself. How are you feeling today? Perhaps you're feeling a bit burnt out, maybe Zoom fatigue or online meeting fatigue. Yeah, Yolanda says feeling positive, wonderful. Maybe you're washing the dishes and just listening. <laughs> I'll admit I do that sometimes, multitasking. Um, maybe you're, um, okay, great, you're tired but optimistic. Maybe you're missing your students, uh, lecturers, uh, le colleagues, campus, feeling a bit tired because we are uh, nearing the end of the year. I know this side we're nearing the end of online exams or what people are calling nowadays alternative <laughs> summative assessment because it's not exams as usual. 
So yes, Patricia says tired. Neil says grateful. Yeah, good but lonely. Oh, and when I hope you um, feel a bit more connected uh, today through being here with uh, so many colleagues. Yeah, blessed, tired, exciting for life through the challenges. Yeah. For me, I'm also very excited to be here with you all virtually today. Um, and I'll start with, you know, a colleague of mine and friend, she actually said to me last night, she said, you know, how are you doing has saved me. Um, you know, she said, I, I just asked my students, how are you doing? And I kept in touch. Um, and that was, I mean, she's an opera lecturer, something very hard to teach online and the students had their first uh, exam and she said you know them they sang like angels <laughs> and she was so impressed um, and it's been a big relief yeah I'm sure for many uh, you know can we have that as well but how we feel going back to you know how are we doing how we feel actually matters but how we work with teach or learn from um, others online and today I'm hoping to share some practical advice around facilitating with care online and why we need to care about this. I'll be drawing on my experiences, as Eunice said, of supporting staff and students at Rhodes University and co-facilitating the Facilitating Online course for staff across Africa as part of the Emerge Africa Network. And I notice a lot of familiar names. Um, some of you have taken the course. Maybe you want to put up your hands. And colleagues, you can look at, you know, maybe ask your colleagues about their course experience um, at a later stage. So I'm going to be sharing some ideas and principles from online facilitation and trauma-informed pedagogies. And my hope is that we can be better humans for each other online in these uncertain and difficult times as well as beyond. Okay, I'm going to share a link to the slides as well. Um, they're often a collage of notes and links in the notes sections, but I'm going to, I'll share a link later and you can go through them in your own time. So this probably looks very familiar. It's from your student contingency plan document. Um, so let's, you know, rewind a few months to a few months ago. University sent students mobile data. Uh, there were laptop schemes. The government's no student or institution left behind ideal, um, you know, really, I think, involved quite a few assumptions. The first one was that going online was a solution to the disruptions caused by teaching and learning, um, you know, during this pandemic. It was as if there was a switch one can just flick and suddenly lecturers can teach online and students can learn online in different ways whether this be in relation actually to online learning or distance learning via printed materials. I think by now we all know that this involved a lot of planning, rethinking courses, uh, developing online or printed materials, designing activities. Um, and when we had, when we pivoted, we had very little time. It was about rapid improvisation. At CPUT, I know you use the term multimodal in your contingency document. I think no matter what one calls it, emergency remote teaching, ERT or multimodal, it was assumed people could switch modes at the top of a hat. Um, and this was not ideal for many of us, but we did it. Whether you're a student, a, star, um, a lecturer, a staff members supporting others and so forth. We are unified by a moment where life as we know it has been turned upside down and we each have our own individual stories of how we've been adapting to digital practices, resilience, loss, grief, anger, corona fatigue. Many of you may have been ill or lost family members or friends. It's no understatement that this year has been hard on everyone. And for some, it's actually been a lot harder than others. Sorry, I'm trying to go. There we go. Whoops, one back. So 
So what have we learned so far this year? We've learned that delivering materials online is really not enough. We cannot simply put materials online or send out printing, printed materials and expect learning to happen. There has to be mediation or facilitation. Whatever mode you're working in and you're not seeing your students, you know, it helps to sometimes think about yourself as this invisible teacher. Um, is what you're asking your students to do clear? Is the process of engagement explicit? How should they manage the volume of work? We actually have to spend quite a bit of time explaining and scaffolding things that we often maybe forget about because they seem obvious to us. We've also learned that pivoting can be harder depending on the context. Maybe there are disciplinary challenges, diversity in connectivity, access to resources and digital fluencies or practices. Many of us had to learn, relearn and unlearn things. We reflected um, and realized sometimes that maybe we were a bit too focused on the technology. Um, the pandemic really, I think, reminded us that life is fragile. So we had to learn to be human in our use of technology. How we structured our materials, set deadlines, communicated with students and so forth. We improvised as we went along. We became sensitive to differential access to resources as well as trauma. Teaching, learning and doing research, such activities are really difficult when there is a pandemic. The impact of the pandemic meant we are all carrying social and emotional loads that weren't there before and we were expected to perform as normal online. You know, pivoting is easy, right? <laughs> You know, um, delivering materials, whether it's online or through print, is also about transferring ownership of responsibility for learning. For many of our students, they had not yet become equipped with academic literacies, getting a feel for how studying at a university differs from school. So learning to learn online was new for many, and self-regulated learning that came with this new flexibility is still a challenge. We are learning that online learning is also far from equal. But drawing on the work of Martin Oliver and Leslie Gawley who argue that digital literacies are socio-material assemblages I think this is an opportunity to better understand the socially situatedness, to fully grasp how emergency remote teaching and learning is experienced. It's not just about material access in the form of device ownership and connectivity. It's also about other you know, social inequalities. A space and a time to study are scarce resources when you're sharing a small home with many family members. And this is the lived reality of some of our students. A few universities carried out student experience surveys and there have been national and international surveys that a lot of South African universities have contributed to. And the findings so far are very diverse, but what is emerging is that the emotional challenges seem to be exceeding the technology related ones. Our students had to learn online overnight and were not prepared. This image is from a blog post by Michael Rowe about universal principles for learning task design in a crisis and the need to prioritize asynchronous and low-tech approaches in South African contexts where we have extreme inequalities between students. This year has also been interesting in that we learned to about who our students are at home and that this is quite different to who they are on campus. At home, students face a whole lot of challenges. More privileged people can hardly begin to understand. For some, the physical campus offers things they can't get at home. Three meals a day, a bed to sleep in, a quiet and safe place to study, better access to healthcare. 
um, this article was shared in our newsletter um, by the Equity and Institutional Culture Directorate at Rhodes, and it mentions the difficulty some students encounter juggling roles at home um, that actually they find you know need to come first before being a student. The article mentions self-expression that some students cannot exercise um, this different forms of self-expression freely at home in the way that they might at university and also HIV positive students are able to better access ARTs when they are at the physical university through the campus healthcare clinics. As a middle class white woman I cannot begin to say I understand but I'd like to, for us to recognize that there are individual stories of resilience all around us and I also recognize that it can take an emotional toll on some of us just being confronted with such realities. Going online is not a solution for all. Government's mottos of saving lives, save the academic year, um, and no student or institution left behind, you know, was a wonderful, um, you know, ideal. It's very aspirational. It's an ideal we can strive for. But by now, I think many of us know that it's very hard to do in practice where existing inequalities and challenges have become more visible than ever before. Okay, next slide. Okay, I think someone, I think you're sharing it. I'm just moving to pivoting to mobile connection. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my joys. Okay. All right. I'm, it says connected. So I'm good. I'm coming in. Sorry, Daniela. Thank you. Colleagues, just bear with us so that you can uh, rejoin with technologies. Anything can happen. And uh, yeah, you saw with the beginning, I couldn't be there. Now the keynote is struggling. And uh, let's hope that she's going to rejoin. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Apologies for that. Um, <laughs> it's so fascinating how you talk about connectivity and then things like this happen. Um, but we, another thing we've learned is to be flexible and to, you know, just take things as they come. So, yeah. <clears throat> I'm not sure how much you, what the last thing you heard was. Um. um Nicola, you talked about uh, um, learning online being emo uh, emotionally challenging. Okay, and did I share about the sort of student challenges um, and government? Did I get there yeah, yet? Yeah, you spoke about um, you said. Yes, you spoke about HIV AIDS and having difficulties to draw to get ARTs when you're not on campus. Mm. Okay, great. So I did talk about that. Thank you so much, Daniela. So yeah, going online has not been easy, <laughs> as we even see now. Um, the idea of saving the academic year, no student left behind, is very aspirational. And I think while we all can, 
you know, we strive for it as an ideal. It's actually very hard to do in practice um, because of existing inequalities and challenges that have become more visible um, than ever before. So that was a bit of a whirlwind tour of some of the things I think we've learned so far and we can probably all, you know, agree on and the challenges that are part of our shared context. So given this, what do you think? Can we practice care online? Uh, please share your thoughts in the chat. I'm sure some of you are judging from the sessions. You're already doing this quite well. Okay, you say yes, we can. Sometimes that WhatsApp message to a class, you know, how are you folks doing? Yeah, Sean, Sean Lay says, my lecturers have shown so much compassion. That's wonderful. So I think the verdict is that, it, you know, just from folks who are responding, people say, yes, you know, it's, it's not impossible. Um, Oluwasian says yes by providing psychosocial support on social media or instant messaging. Yes, and we'll talk a bit more about that. Yeah, so it is possible, and I think maybe there's also levels of care um, and different types of care. Maybe we have different, you know, philosophical underpinnings for how we do it. <clears throat> and you're welcome to share examples from your own contexts um, about your either providing care or your experience of, of care. Yeah, Megan says, in replying to emails from students and having empathy, Yes, yeah, so empathy should be exercised online. Not everyone is on the same level. Yeah, as we've men as we've seen, um, you know, students have such different challenges. Okay, can I go back to the slides? <laughs> Sorry, folks. Not sure who was sharing there. Um, So now we're going to move from care to facilitation. And I think that, you know, you can't have online facilitation without care because to facilitate means to make easy. And it's actually a bit broader than online support. Online support is really one aspect. It requires, you know, specific capabilities. Um, Technology is another aspect. I really like this quote and I want to highlight that the with and between students as well. It's very much a mutual process. It's not simply about delivering materials online, like the little meme. You know, it's all these things are human things that good teachers and peers do well. Encouraging, helping, engaging, in addition to support. It's really about a process and good online facilitation, I think, can help us create enabling learning spaces online. So after the session and in your own time, you can work through this. Um, it's a matrix for facilitator capabilities that we share with colleagues taking the facilitating online course to use for self-assessment. Um, I'm not going to discuss it in de detail, but I want to highlight that technical skills is only one aspect. During the emo, you know, emo this pivoting or to to this emergency um, mode, we sometimes I think got wrapped up in the technical, or were a bit maybe some of us were a bit overwhelmed with the technology that we forgot about the very important value of the other things, the human aspect, you know, that your social skills, online communication skills, 
um, all those things actually matter and that you many of us have these resources in our face-to-face -face spaces but found it perhaps hard to do initially online Okay, so once we recognize the importance of online facilitation as a process and a practice that we can develop, there are some theoretical tools we can draw on for this moment and beyond. And one of these, I think, is trauma-informed pedagogy. The work involved in learning tasks is known as cognitive loads. The pandemic has created social and emotional loads. And for some student, it has added to or amplified existing social and emotional loads. So when someone is managing these loads, it's really hard to learn. It actually increases cognitive load. And when cognitive load goes up, then learning motivation and collaboration go down. I've heard some lecturers say, you know, mental health isn't part of my job. They see it as uh, this kind of care as something that can be outsourced to counseling centers. Um, and what I'm talking about is not really the same thing. I want to stress that it's about intentional support strategies. It's not the same as mental health, but it does impact it. I also don't want us to feel guilty. We went online in such a rush. It was really difficult to get to where we are now and maybe we contributed to students cognitive loads you know maybe lecturers I mean students contributed to lecturers students you know the other way as well um, but I'm hoping we can share some strategies for how to reduce the load and I see intentionally supportive online facilitation as a way we might reduce cognitive load and part of practicing trauma-informed pedagogy. So the first thing that we do with such approaches is that we recognize trauma, both in ourselves and for others, such as our students, our colleagues, our lecturers. Think about whether you answer yes to any of these questions, right? Think about your experience in the past few months. Do basic tasks take longer to complete than normal? Do you find it harder to keep track of things? Do you find it difficult to feel motivated to study, to teach, do research, or show up in general? Is it harder to prioritize tasks, engage with classmates or the subject, manage time, or simply, you know, not quit? So if you answered yes to some of these, or maybe all of these, you know, it's a sign that, you know, <laughs> cognitive load has been a very real part of our experience. So this topic of trauma-informed pedagogies is a lot more complex than I can discuss it here. But I thought I also, you know, I just want to share summary so there are some resources in the slides you can look at um, that go into more detail here are the main principles the first one is about safety and it's about creating a safe space a safe learning environment for your students a friend of mine Dr. Hannah Grossman from UCLA did a presentation for Emerge Africa a while ago and introduced us to these six trauma-informed learning principles and how they can be applied to support learning. And I thought about these in relation to online facilitation and realized that, you know, yes, there, there are ways to do this online. And these principles and the questions help us to reflect on our current practices. So because these are so contextual, I think it's up to you know everyone to think about this largely in, in your own context. 
I'm just going to move forward to discussing the Cengage Student Voices Survey and then come back to that. So the 2020 Cengage Student Voices Survey report contains insights into students' experiences of remote learning across different regions, how students felt their courses might be improved, the kinds of resources they found useful. Um, have any of you, used, you heard of Cengage? You can type in the text chat. What they do. So they sell sort of textbooks and online textbooks and resource packs. Yes, Megan says they're publishers. Correct. All right. So something else I just want to highlight is that this is really commercial rather than academic research. The bigger picture is that they want to sell textbooks to you. And from their survey findings, you know, things like, you know, questions, question banks of self-test practice questions, you know, it's in their interest to highlight this because that's what they want to sell to you. The survey also assumes students know what kind of materials and pedagogies are best for their learning, which we know is often not the case. Also, not every subject can have practice questions, right? And this tends to favor remote learning. Course guidance and independent learning. Um, I think lecturers can you know, scaffold and try to facilitate, but it often depends on how students take this up. But what was fascinating for me, just going to the right, um, was that the pandemic challenges question. I mean, look at the emotional challenges and how much greater these are than technology challenges. I also see these reflected in the trauma-informed principles and how important those are. So staying motivated to continue my studies, um, missing interaction with peers, keeping up with the course, and then internet connectivity and so forth. Um, but also, again, keeping in touch. So, yeah, while there are technology things, I think the bulk of these have really are really social. There were some regional differences in their survey. Um, they found that South African students were more likely than others to state that staying motivated was a challenge along with keeping up with their coursework. Um, and, you know, then connectivity. Apparently, there was, they were less likely to find the loss of peer interaction a challenge. I think perhaps this is a reflection of those who were able to complete the survey, as we know that peer interaction and support is really crucial for learning, especially among your first generation students, who are often too nervous to seek support um, from their lecturers. So while, you know, there's some, yeah, I, I'm offering a bit of critique about this I'm also I want to say that notice how a lot of these are related to you know when we have too much cognitive load and the difficulties this creates for learning all right I see time is moving so rather than go back to the other one, I think you can look at it in your own time. So if we think about these three, equality, equity, justice, in relation to ERT or multimodal teaching and learning, the first box can be thought of as, okay, great, let's give everyone material access, you know, data and laptops or printed materials, everyone can participate. Um, but imagine a student in a remote area where there is only 2G connectivity. Even if they have the data and the devices, they still wouldn't be able to participate. Someone in this situation, you know, might move back to res and then 
yeah, some, uh, sorry, so someone in this position, you know, the student in the remote area with the 2G, is unable to see over the fence. Then in the middle, equity, um, that's when we add tr additional support for this person. Let's say they move back to res, they're able to participate. Um, we've seen this at our university where more students have been able to participate as they moved from their home spaces back to you, uh, which was not conducive for learning in any mode, um, and came back to university. The third image is about taking the fence down altogether. Um, you know, what do you think that fence is? Um, and I think this is something to reflect on beyond today, and how the fence is different um, from face-to-face -face teaching and online. Is the fence different? Is the fence higher? Uh, is the fence the same in all course contexts? So I've given folks a lot of things to think about, um, but it's mainly ideas and questions that we can use for reflection. Yeah, I see Faik says pedagogical practices is the fence. Interesting. Yeah, and and I, I think that that's these are things that we we can contemplate and and reflect on, um, and then think about it in relation to how we are facilitating those practices. Um, it's not a, I think, you know, we're not going to have all the answers today, and this is not a quick conversation. We hear the words new normal a lot lately. Um, can we co-create conditions for a better normal through developing consciousness of facilitating with care online? Now that so many people are more comfortable with technology than ever before, I think it's time that we focus our attention to the human aspect. Digital literacies or fluencies is not enough. Um, it's also got to do with people, the people work involved in using technology. And we need to learn about things like care, what it means to facilitate in intentionally supportive ways that enable us to reduce rather than create cognitive overload and so forth. So I'm hoping, you know, let's make 2021 our year, our year to focus on care and being better, you know, doing human better online, you know, with a common humanity where we're sensitive to load and committed to co-creating, enabling spaces for all. Okay. So lots of fascinating discussions coming up in the chat. Oh, thank you, everyone. That was that was really my bit, and I'm hoping that now we can have a conversation given all these questions um, that I'd raised. And I mean, a lot of these resources and ideas and things you can go back to in your own time. Yeah. So Fake says pedagogical practices require design with equity, quality, and equity in mind. Definitely. And justice, yeah, justice as the outcome. Yes, yeah, so in the rush to, you know, emergency remote teaching, did we forget about justice? I don't know. Or did that, you know, we, we did it and then we realized with all the issues students had been raising, um, what are the real things that we actually need to be focusing on? Yeah, justice central to the transformation in higher ed and our pedagogies, says Trinette. Oluwasian says contextualization is critical in prioritizing equity, equality, social justice. Yeah, Sunwabo, I agree with you, and I think you did the course as well. Um, Sunwabo says, I believe facilitating with care is the next level. Yeah, our lecturers are still learning the ropes of blended learning and remote teaching, and they themselves need training with care. Yeah, and how much, if we think about it, how much of all that training? It was a lot of training. 
it was so much cognitive load. Um, I even know from our context, online sessions, guides, you know, lecturers, I think sometimes felt really overwhelmed. Yeah, expecting them, Sunwa Bom, going back to your comment, expecting them to enact or display such skills, maybe a stretch to some level. Yeah, except that, especially with the fact we all need to hit the ground running when COVID hit the country. And online teaching and learning can be so inhumane to apply empathy and care. How do we do this? Yeah, I think a lot of students were not used to that, were not socialized into experiencing care online or what that might look like. And if you haven't experienced it, it's very hard to be able to do that for others. So I think maybe, you know, as we go forward, maybe it's about modeling some of that for students, scaffolding it perhaps a bit more as well. Yeah. Pozan says back to basics, a set, a, re, a, a rest in action, humanity reboot. <laughs> yeah, and I think that, that that's really, for me, I, I feel that's kind of what we need. That's a pleasure, Liesl. Yeah, going back to our value systems, our morals. And Megan says, how can we help students feel safe, show empathy? Feel empowered, praising them for attending online sessions, for participating, achieving good marks, connected, using more than one medium. Yeah. Sorry, Eunice, did you want to say something? Yes, I, I just wanted to ask you if you can give a pers uh, briefly a perspective on uh, experiences from staff members because. As much as uh, you've talked so much about students and how we can meet the students and make sure that uh, we facilitate good teaching with care and at the same time ensure that they learn. How about that shift and how it affected staff members and what can we do going forward because we are still in the pandemic? Thank you, Nicola. Yeah, it's a, that's, a, that's a really, I think there's, there are no easy answers, but from what I've seen, um, it's about modeling a way of being and recognizing and engaging that I think people pick up on and then can use with their students, with their colleagues. Um, I'm hearing more now than ever before, even the question of how are you doing? And I hope we can continue that. You know, checking in with the being um, before we get to business. Um, yeah, the work with staff. I mean, in in my own, you know, what what we see is staff don't. They're so there was so much, and there was so much cognitive load. You send out an email that you think you know you you really put a lot of effort into and you craft it well and it's about you know online sessions and how to get support and those kinds of things and people just aren't reading um or they can't the the social and emotional loads are so big that they can't read for you know then it's for understanding um and really get to grips and i think that that's maybe we've got to sometimes move a bit slower make our you know the kinds of support that we're offering or the resources short explicit clear same with we do what we do for students i think someone mentioned you know different um mediums of dissemination also different um, you know, not just a video, but also a PDF and that kind of thing. And we found that, you know, you tell people, go and watch this short how-to video. Um, others want that walkthrough, that PDF walkthrough. Um, and also the timing when you provide what. I think it's too much, you know, sometimes giving people too much at one time contributes to overload. So it's about knowing when to give what. And that is really, I think, a facilitation skill that one develops. 
is knowing what what is the right thing at the right time and i've even i've thought about this a lot in supporting um colleagues is you know and, and i've even reflected on my own practice is this right for this moment um is this the right thing for this group of people right now um is it too much so we started i think communicating actually and sending out information once from going regularly once a week or twice a week to perhaps once every two weeks and not adding to that load that lecturers were already experiencing with lots of emails from students i hope that answers your question Eunice but I think colleagues also have are probably going to share some I'm sure there are a lot of ideas in the chat as well um, uh, yes Nicola and I think we've run out of time um, I, and uh, I just want uh, uh, to thank you for a very enlightening keynote I think we've learned a lot and uh, that we're gonna be infusing um, the, the care aspect in our dealings with students and, and all that. A few things I need to note is that uh, providing materials online or study, study packs or uh, memory sticks with materials is not enough. There has to be mediation. And I think that is something staff members should take home with. They have to create ways of scaffolding, communicating to students and engaging with materials with students for them to be successful in uh, uh, learning. We can't just provide materials and expect them to learn without mediating the learning process. The other thing I wanted to uh, talk is um, uh, providing care online is not the same. Uh, uh, is it? Uh, and it's a question: Is it the same as providing it uh, uh, face to face? And of course, it's different because when it is face to face, uh, you have the student with you, and uh, also there's a, a barrier. This, you may not even know that the student needs care. So I think emergency remote teaching actually highlighted. The, some of the issues students needed to be cared for. The other thing is on the trauma-informed uh, pedagogy, that uh, the, the social and emotional load incre increases, and uh, that leads to the cognitive, cognitive aspect going down. I think as uh, staff members, we actually need to think about how we can balance the three the social and emotional and uh, the cognitive load so that uh, if we don't lose the cognitive load because that is if we lose it then it means we're going to have less student success so the three of them we've got to balance them yeah and uh, the i think what was really missing is how uh, um using this uh ethics of care pedagogy and uh, perspectives of how staff members uh, felt across uh, Africa or in South Africa about uh, the remote teaching and learning. Um, I hope that would have come and uh, uh, we judge how we felt ourselves. Otherwise, Nicola, it was really, really enlightening. We thank you so much. And uh, we, can also, we can engage with you. We're gonna provide uh, um, your email to our staff members. And if they have questions, they can still ask uh, questions about this. Thank you very much. I don't know if you have something to say in closing. I just wanna say thank you to you all, um, given and, and for the discussion and your you know, engagement in the session and interest you know, I haven't, as I said, I haven't got all the answers. I don't even think I, I was even questioning whether it was as coherent as I would like, because <laughs> as you know, with the loads and doing things during the pandemic, everything, things are kind of a bit slower and disjointed, disjointed. So I appreciate that you found 
value in a you know discussion that was probably a little unstructured and chaotic. Um, yes, you're still the slides. I will share the link with you. But thank you, everyone, and I wish you a wonderful day further for your teaching with uh, with technology day. I'm sure you're going to have some great conversations. Thank you, Nicola, and uh, have a good day, Father. We appreciate. Um, with that, uh, colleagues, we are going to uh, uh, break away rooms, and uh, you can see the link on the screen. Those who are remaining in, in Penu 1, you can click on that. Penu 2, you can click on the link. But I'm not, I think when you want, uh, people in who don't want to leave the section now are uh, in when you want. But Daniela, you can guide them. Yes, so we have two rooms. You are currently in when you want. So if you're interested in presentations in room one, you can just stay here. Those who want to um, listen to any of the other presentations in venue two would have to be um, use the links in um to venue one two and i'm going to copy them into the chat so you can just click on the if you want to move into venue two just click on the the link to venue two and you're going to start in three minutes <laughs> 10 30 so yeah very quick comfort break and then we'll start at 10 30 again Yeah, you have to click from the, the chat, the chat, not the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint is not live. Colleagues. <laughs> 